All right. Good morning. Uh, we're usually doing these in the afternoon. Had a couple of schedule shifts. So uh, coming to you live Friday morning to talk about our real estate stats. So every month, Brenna and I get together to talk about and review the Denver Metro report as to what's going on in our real estate market. Again, everybody's got a story to tell, uh, but do the numbers actually back that story up? So uh, Brenna with Land Title, thankfully Land Title puts together these numbers, does the research for us so that we get to just geek out and, um, you know, analyze and, and make predictions and, and all of that fun stuff. So um, Brenna, go ahead and, and introduce yourself um, to those that, that may not know you, though, everybody on this Facebook feed and that should know you. Well, good morning, everyone. Um Glad to be here. My name is Brenna Harper. I'm with Land Title Guarantee Company. Um, I'm one of the sales reps that covers the uh, Lodo Highlands area primarily. Um, and so we're just going to walk through some of the Metro Denver stats, um, what's going on on the market, going on in the market. Um, you know, Matt and I talk about this a lot, obviously. Um, so our goal is to break it down. Um, so for people that aren't nerding out, looking at the numbers every month, every day, every week, still can have an understanding, especially as you're entering the market as a buyer or a seller. So um, one big thing as we kind of jump in is, is the market changing and shifting? Yes. Is it making massive changes and shifts? No. Um, so the bottom's not falling out. The ceiling's not like being whatever. Um, <laughs> There's there small changes, but it, it is a different market than we saw in June, um, July. We do have some seasonality going on. So, uh, you know, a lot of times what we hear is, oh, well, my neighbor sold my house or their house for this um, a few months ago, or so-and-so told me this. So we're trying to put some numbers and data. Um, obviously, buying or selling a home is a very emotional um, time. It's a, it's a very, very large investment. Um, so we're trying to just take some of that emotion out of it so we can just look at the numbers so we can feel more prepared as to what to expect, what are, uh, what are the conditions and what small adjustments do we need to make to be the most successful? Yeah, the, the, the numbers, again, it's part of the story. And then how do we navigate through that as the market changes, we need to change and be ready to change with it, right? <clears throat> So you mentioned that it's it's changing. So what what's changed? What are the what are our highlights here for for the month? Yeah, let me share my screen here. And let me know when you can see the slide. We're good. OK, cool. So I'm just going to jump right in here. Um, so the the big driving factor for a lot of the condition of our market has been the uh, inventory or lack thereof. Um, so this is our market snapshot and green is active listings, blue is pending or under contract and red is sold. So this is a really great kind of bird's eye view of the correlation of these different metrics and um, what they're doing currently. So I want to focus on green, which is active listing. So if we look over here in October, um, unfortunately, we dipped down again in our active listings. So typically this time of year, if we pop back over to um, like 2019, um, it is common for us to have a slower, in, um, slower active inventory. However, we did not have the buildup of active of inventory that we typically have, as you can see in this nice little curve in 2019, we are just kind of struggling here um, to even get above like 4,000, 3,000 all summer. So we definitely are in a deficit of active inventory, which obviously plays lack of supply equals greater demand. So um we are back down to like 3,200 active listings for all of Denver Metro. Um, just to kind of put that in perspective, if we were going to be at a balanced market, so equal opportunity for sellers and buyers, we would be closer to 20,000 homes. Um, so even when this number, you know, people kind of were freaking out that 
things were changing when we had a spike in inventory from May, June to July. Um, but if you look at it comparatively, we were still under 5,000. Um, so we're still very, very low comparatively as we look at this. Yeah, and back into 2019, that number just a shade above 10,000 active homes on the market. And now to be looking at 3,200 homes uh, between seven major Denver metro counties doesn't give people a lot of options. No, it doesn't. Um, so our average sold price right now is still 558 um, combined, um, which is a little bit down month over month, which is completely normally normal. Typically, we do have that seasonality. Um, so I think right now, you know, every I think a lot of people, it's like now is a great time to buy. Now is a great time to sell. And I believe that's true a lot of the time. It's just it depends on um, what your situation is. But I do feel like right now it's a great time to buy because it's less competitive than it has been. But it's also a great time to sell because our market is still extremely strong. And we had such great appreciation through this last year um, that you're riding the coattails of that. So even if you don't get, um, and we'll go into this a little bit later, but even if you don't get those 25 offers and six figures above asking, your, your home has still appreciated because of those other solds. So on the list side or selling your home, you're still getting incredible value for your house. On the buy side, you just may have less competition and not have to throw the kitchen sink at it. So um, if you're a buyer and you have been pounding your head against a wall, trying to get into a home during this uh, summer and spring craziness, this actually truly might be a great time um, for you to have less competition and still be able to get into a home. Yeah. And I think when we take a look at the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the last couple of, of years, February starts kind of that, that buying season, that, that trend where more buyers are getting um, into the market. We're seeing active inventory also increase. So for buyers, if you can make it swing in the next couple of months, you might have a little bit easier, <laughs> a little bit easier time getting into the property that you like, as opposed to, say, you know, March, April, uh, or May of 2022. Now, again, asterisks, that's if this, this trend that we've seen the last couple of years remains true. And I anticipate that it will. I anticipate that it'll remain true, that we will see that, that continued seasonality. The numbers might shift a little bit, but I don't think we're going to see the seasonality just kind of change. Well, and to that point, typically we have a slow start to January um, and then February, March is when we really get into that buying season. Um, the last couple of years, I feel like that has been bumped up even just a couple of weeks um, every year, respectively. So last year, it was only like two weeks of January that was slow and then it was off to the races. Now, granted, we're coming off of 2020 when people have been pent up and they just are ready for a new year. Um, so things may be a little bit different. But even before that, um, people, as soon as the holidays are over, um, you know, you get through New Year's and then people are ready to go. So if you are that buyer, um, don't wait until... February or March, try to do it now because more people and more people and more people are getting into the market sooner after the holidays. Well, I think it's interesting to look at the seasonality, especially from a flipper's vision. You know, if you can pick up a property here in November, December, let's say it takes 60 days or 90 days to get the house uh, ready to sell, you're looking at buying it now where there's not much inventory and definitely not a, as much competition and then taking advantage and kind of riding the coattails of the market as it rolls right up in the spring. I think right now is a fantastic time if you're a flipper to take a look at the market. Yep, absolutely. Um, this is the active listings. I think we've chatted about it a lot, but this just kind of shows how low we are. Um, so even if November and December, we had a great amount of increase, we still would be incredibly short. Now, we would welcome that increase um, and we need it. But even from like Matt was talking about in 2019, we're just under that 10,000. That's about half of what we need, according to the numbers, to be balanced. So um, 
we need those active listings to come onto the market. It's it's not a bad thing. It's not going to flip our market upside down um, if we get those listings. It's just gonna it's just gonna feel better um, and be less cattywampus. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> and again, as, as we've talked about, we are, we're seeing homes hit the market. It's not that people are on the fence and just don't want to sell. Homes are going on the market every day. And we're maybe a little bit below where we were last year for number of sales, but last year was a record setting year. So homes yeah. are still coming on the market. You just have to run and run fast. And unfortunately, um, this is the first month in a while that we haven't been positive in new listings. So just to explain these two metrics really quick. So active listings is when we pull this data, how many homes are available on the market? Mm -hmm. um, so if I was to pull this today, it would be different than it was yesterday. Um, so that one's a little bit of a moving target, but it's kind of um, like our bench or our, our supply. So it, it changes. The new inventory um, is how many homes came onto the market new in that month. Um, so the last couple of months, we've had positive uh, or an increase in new listings. We've just been absorbing them quickly. So it's kept our active inventory low. This month, which is very seasonal, we actually were lower um, month over month in our new listings, which does not help active listings at all. And that is why we saw such a dip this month. So um, yes, people are still putting their homes on the market. Less people put their homes on the market as it comes uh, after daylight savings time, as the holidays come, as it gets colder, all of those things. Um, so that's just part of what plays into the seasonality. Yeah. And, you know, there's uh, th this kind of old mindset that you know, people don't want to move in the middle of a school year and, and it's not a good time to do it right now. Um, the, the reality, not everybody that's moving is uh, is concerned about the school year, right? People buy and sell homes around life events oftentimes, and it's not always uh, the school year's life event. Well, and I think a lot of times people are moving within the school district as well. So, um, you know, it's a bigger concern, I would feel, if you're moving school districts and maybe it's a new school. But a lot of times people are just moving up homes. Now, remember, some of our parents lived in the same home from the time they brought us home from the hospital until they sent us off to college. Um, but people are moving more often now. We're moving every like five to seven years. So it's just become a lot more common. It's, it's still a massive event, um, but it's not as big um, as it was maybe 15, 20 years ago, because people are doing it more often. Yeah, absolutely. So this plays into the active inventory. This is month supply of inventory. So if no more homes came on the market, how long would it take for um, our market to absorb or for all the homes to be sold? So we're at 0.63, which is just shy of three weeks of inventory. Um, National Association of Realtors says six months of inventory. Uh, the People in Denver economy, they say closer to four months. So again, if we look back to 2019, we were about half of that, which is on par with we were about half of the active listings. So that kind of makes sense there. Um, but we're down to three under three weeks. So it's very, very quick and obviously a deficit there. Uh, it, it's moving quick. You got to you know run and jump on that train as, it, as it's rolling. So the interesting thing is typically when we see a dip in active inventory and we see month supply of inventory really shy, very small, we see days in MLS go up. Um, but we didn't see that happen. Um, now, again, we're going to talk about this number, but then we're going to look at it big picture. So active inventory went down, but we're still at 14 days. Um, so we're plateauing as far as how many uh, days a property is staying in the MLS. So that tells me that um, there's still some buyer fatigue that's playing into this and buyers understand value. So if you are a seller and you're trying to put your home on the market for prices that were appropriate in June and you're not staging it and you're taking iPhone photos, it's going to sit on the market. So we are still having plenty of homes go in a flash sale, which is what we consider anything seven days or less. Um, 
But there are other homes that are sitting on the market because of they are overpriced or because of um, potentially their location or because of their condition. So it it's gotten competitive in some areas, but as far as the speed of the market, we're plateauing a little bit. Now, with that being said, if we look back historically, we are still incredibly fast. So last year we were at 23 days and in 2019, our last normal year, we were at 33 days. Um, so 14 days seems slow compared to the nine, 10 days we were at this summer, but historically it's still incredibly quick. So um, take that with a grain of salt. Don't drag your feet too much, but maybe you don't have to go out at your lunch hour. Uh, maybe you can wait until after you get off work. Yeah, it's in every home is going to be slightly different. Every seller's got a slightly different strategy or philosophy as it comes to you know how they want to proceed and move forward. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, and I had a, a thought around this days in the MLS before it goes under contract. Now, uh, you probably have to talk to an economist, somebody a whole lot smarter than me. Brenna, maybe you can chime in on this because we know that you're smarter than I am. Um, but as the as the inventory levels have have gone down and we're seeing the homes that aren't selling, they're, they're overpriced and the condition may be maybe bad. Those might be staying on longer. So so the the days in MLS might go up in this scenario really because of the percentage of the mixture of sellable homes yep. has really changed, right? The sellable homes are still going very fast. And the homes that were on the market last month that haven't had a price reduction are still on the home are still on the market this month is, is kind of changing those days in MLS. So again, uh, I'd, I'd be curious as to your take on, on that correlation. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's kind of twofold with that. So, um, I definitely think there's homes, we've seen them, um, we've talked about them, the home in our neighborhood that sat on the market for three months and did over $100,000 of uh, price reductions. That messes with the average. When the home two doors down from us sells in two days, and then this one sits on for three months, that really pushes the average. Um, so there's definitely some of that. There's also, I think, less tolerance for um those kind of homes right now, because when you were in June and July and you were looking and you were going six figures over asking, maybe you were looking at some of those homes in a lesser condition because you're saying, if I'm going to put this money into the house anyway, maybe I can get this one um, with less competition and then just spend the money putting in new countertops or fixing the landscaping or whatever. Um, but now that it's less competitive, People don't want to do the work if they don't have to. Um, perceived or real, you know, if it if it doesn't look a certain way, you know, we buy with our eyes. So I think it, it's kind of twofold, Matt. I think yes, absolutely. There's those homes that are sitting on the market and they're messing with our averages, um, and those homes that are selling on the market. There's probably a few more of them because people can be a little bit more picky and they're choosing not to to go after those homes. Yeah, when you, when you can be a little bit choosier, people are typically going to choose the, the nicer option. Yeah. So where's the next spot that we're looking uh, here on the, on our data? So I'm going to go to, actually, I'm just going to pop back over here. <laughs> So this is our sold analysis. So this is how many homes sell every month. Um, so typically um, we hit that 5,000 mark in about May um, and it lasts through August or so. Um, last year was different because we had a delayed buying season. Um, but then this year, as we're talking about, um, you know, people coming into the market sooner. So if you list your home, in February or March, then it it um, sells, it, it closes in March, wait, sorry, February or March, March or April. Um, so typically beforehand, we were seeing again, May as the month that homes were selling because maybe they're coming on March and April is really the big time. Well, this month we saw 5,000 homes start to close in March, which means those homes were listed 
in early February, maybe even January. Um, and then we've kept over 5,000 even through October. So our selling season has been ex uh, extended and it's been really strong this, this year. So we would, we would anticipate to see in November and December, this number creep down below that 5,000 mark. But we also were anticipating if we're looking at the data that in September and definitely October, we would be under 5,000 and we're still holding strong. So people are still buying houses um, and they're still buying a lot of houses in Colorado, in Metro Denver. Yeah. People buying second homes, vacation rentals, uh, you know, the Airbnbs, uh, people are accumulating, uh, you know, property. Yep. It's a good investment. So average sold price. Um, so yes, if we look at this, it has come down from the peak. Um, so people always worry about buying at the, at the peak of the market or at the top of the market. Well, if you look historically, there's a peak of the market every year. Um, and if you miss it, just wait a year. Um, <laughs> so we're seeing if you're buying a home now, or if you're selling a home now, um, or if you're buying a home now, you're like, oh man, um, you know, if you bought in June, you're like, man, I bought the top of the market. What's going to happen? Well, if it follows the trend, you're going to be just fine. We're seeing five digit appreciation at the at the peak of the season, we were seeing six digit appreciation, um, which is 10% year over year. So yeah, there's some seasonality and that happens, but it's still continuing to go up. Um, and even if it doesn't go up as steeply, even if it starts to plateau and even off a little bit, you're not losing money. You're just not gaining it as quickly. Um, so on the list side or on the sell side, if it's, it's a pretty safe investment um, as far as being able to sell your home um, or buy a home and not be at the top of the market. Um, if you're buying and you're trying to outsave the market, that's going to be really difficult. So right now we're at $63,000 year over year difference. Um, and that's with nothing else changing. So that's interest rates and, and everything else staying the same. We're $63,000 more. So this time next year, it's probably going to be that or more plus whatever happens with interest rates. So you might be buying a home for less home for more money. Um, so when you're having that conversation um, about waiting to save a little bit more, take a look at this graph. If there's a way for you to get into the market now um, using, you know, talking to your lenders, using some different financing um, or even buying a home and using the home as an investment to buy your dream home, that is a lot easier than trying to outsave the market. Yeah. And, and some folks that I talk to, they're like, well, I, I want to make sure that I have the 20% down so that I don't pay mortgage insurance. And and I've been in in those shoes as well as a, as a buyer, right? Now, let's, let's say that last year you bought a home and put 10% down you could have put 20% down, but you kept the other 10%. So um, over the last year, you saw a double digit or 10% or 11%, some areas even higher percentage appreciation. Now you have uh, the equity that you could look at a refinance or have an appraisal done and drop the mortgage insurance. And you still had the cash that you would have spent um, on the front end of it. So you know, the, the market's been good. Now, what's interesting, and I remember when I got into the real estate market in 2014, I kept hearing from so many people, they're like, well, I'm just going to wait for the market to crash because it's going to crash here soon. It's going to crash at the end of the year or next year. Nobody has a crystal ball, right? The market goes up, the market goes down. Overall, real estate's a very solid, sound investment for a multitude of different reasons. But the folks that have been waiting for the market to crash since 2014 are, are still waiting for it to crash. It didn't even crash in a global pandemic um, for, again, for a multitude of reasons. It, it doesn't mean that the market's not going to correct or change at some point in the future. We just don't know when, what that looks like. But if you're buying it for a pure investment standpoint, Make sure that the numbers work when you go in and buy it. 
If you're buying it because, well, it's a two bedroom house and I work from home and now we've got kids and I've outgrown my space, I need a bigger home. That's not changing. Even if the market goes down, the market changes. If you bought that bigger house, you still have what you bought. It's still a good investment. Hang on to it for the long term. If you can afford to keep it, you should never lose in real estate. Yep. Yeah, that was going to be my point. Exactly, Matt. We went through a global pandemic. We're still going through a global pandemic. And we have just um, sped up appreciation, which obviously isn't the case um, for every outlier that may happen. Um, but I mean, I remember, I think I bought in 2014 the first time and that appreciation was was crazy. And we are surpassing that now. So um, 10 digit or sorry, double digit appreciation, 10 percent is incredible. The national average is about 4 percent um, and that would still be great. So even if things slow down, 4 percent appreciation is better than you do in most investments. Yeah. And, and it's not just a 4%, right? Think about real estate. If you borrow the money for 95% of it, you're still getting the appreciation on the whole amount. You didn't have to have uh, that, that figure. Now, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine who bought his house in 2007 at the peak of that market, right? Now he bought it in 2007. Next year, the market's crashed. It's going down. It's going down even further in 2009, 2010, 2011, as, as things start to turn around and change. He has significantly more equity today than he had in 2007 when he bought. His house is worth so much more money today. It's as if the, the recession, the crash didn't actually happen. And it just continued on that trend line. Okay. And then the last one I want to talk about is our sold to list price. Um, so this again talks to how competitive the market is, um, some strategy as far as um, where you're listing, where you're, uh, where you're putting in your offers. Um, so this metric is the price that the home is listed for compared to the, the price that it's sold for. Um, so at the peak of the market, it was 106% of that list price. That's very abnormal, as you can see. Um, so we have come back down. We're at 101.8%, um, which is still high historically. So typically what happens is we sit at this like 99, um, 98, 99% of sold to list. And then right at the peak of our um, selling season, April, May, June, we flirt with that hundred, maybe a little bit over, and then we come back down and it's just this little curve. Um, but the market's been very, very strong for several years. Well, last half of 2020 and then through 21, we just blew the top off of that um, because of the shortage of inventory, low interest rates and a, a plethora of other things. So we went to 106%, um, which is very, very volatile. It's not sustainable. Um, it's extremely competitive. So this number dropping is good. This is what we want. We want it to come back closer to that 100% line. Um, as a buyer, this should show you that you don't have to, in most cases, go so much over asking that you did in the summer months. Um, you still may end up paying the same amount for the home because of that appreciation we talked about, um, but at least hopefully you're not having to take as much out of pocket um, past what it appraises for. And on the list side, you're not in June and July anymore. So don't be mad when you only get five offers and they're only a couple thousand dollars over asking. The market has changed. It's still a great market, but just look at the difference and set your expectations so you're not annoyed or just setting yourself up for disappointment because the market has shifted a little bit. Yeah. And, and it, what's interesting, right. Is, as we look at where that was uh, in, in January for percentage over list price, <clears throat> then the homes that came on the market, you know, in March after the January homes had closed, well, they set a new benchmark, right? So it went from here to here, and then the homes that come on in May, well, they've already taken the, the benchmark of the March homes and they went up even higher 
right? And you could see where that just that exponentially grew and compounded on itself. Uh, an interesting deal, right? And so many times buyers will ask me, well, what do you think this house is going to sell for? I don't know, right? Yeah. That, that That's the ultimate answer is I just don't know because so many people are were throwing everything at it that they could writing some very interesting uh, interesting pieces uh, into their offers it just every single home is going to be a, <clears throat> excuse me a little unique a little different as to what ultimately the seller uh, gets out of it absolutely and um that that quick of appreciation is just not sustainable it causes massive affordability issues um so if you are, I mean, we're all happy as homeowners. We're like, sweet, this is great appreciation. Um, but as far as the stability um, of our market and our economy, it's it's good to have it a little bit more balanced. So, and again, 101.8% of sold to list is still record breaking and it's still fantastic. So um, don't be greedy um, <laughs> and just know how great we have it right now just adjust your lens a little bit. Yeah, right. If I went to sell my car on, you know, uh, Auto Trader today, it, it, nobody's going to come and be like, here, you want, you know, $10,000 for your car, Matt. Uh, I'm, I'm going to give you 12. Um, well, they and, might right now because of the car shortage, <laughs> but, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's uh, it, nothing else that we sell is operating in this space right now at the moment. Right. Um, it's just an interesting dynamic going at it. So um, <clears throat> now one thing, and, and Brenna, you and I didn't prep for this, so I'm going to kind of put you on the spot, but it is something that I know that you're familiar with and it's, um, it's what just happened with Zillow. Yeah. Right. So for those that, that don't know, right. Zillow is an information site uh, that, that, has homes that are for sale and sometimes homes that are not for sale. It's not always the most accurate site, but they got into buying homes directly from the consumer. And, uh, and some news came out here recently um, on, on Zillow. So they uh, have lost about a half a billion dollars trying to buy and sell real estate. Now this is a, a company that has a lot of information, right? They, they track information, but couldn't figure out the, the pricing as it stands. We're overpaying for homes and lost a half a billion on it and then laid off about 25% of their workforce. Um, that's unfortunate, right? Those are people that lost their jobs. But what um, what's kind of your take on what's gone on here with Zillow and their buying and then now you know, bowing out of the game? Yeah, um, you know, it's very interesting. Obviously, it's a hot topic um, in our industry. Um, I think there's a couple of things. First of all, they were buying above the the market by l large percentages. Um, and they were on some levels maybe trying to buy market share because if you have all of the properties, then you can control um, if you're the one setting the prices, then people have to pay them. Um, and even in the market that we were in, people were rejecting that. So, you know, those homes that are sitting on the market for three months, um, even when these people are writing 30 offers on homes, they're still not willing to pay that much over, um, at least to start. They want to see the value in the list price, and then they can determine if they want to pay over it because they love it, not that the home is overpriced um, to start. So they just, they're, they've they been unable to move their inventory. We saw this um, in Arizona as well. They, you know, we, I don't know if we talked about this before, but we um, bought an investment property and they were listing it for lower than they bought it for. And that was my first indication because that's not how they were doing it here, um, that something was shifting. Because um, you know, I'm not a massive investor, but I know that's not good when you're trying to sell something for less than you bought it for, um, you know, a month or two later. So the other thing is that the real estate agent and that connection and that understanding is irreplaceable um, because information is great. 
computers are great. Algorithms are great. We use them every day, but they don't understand the neighborhoods. They don't understand the human behavior. They don't understand specific areas. Um, because even when you look at greater Metro Denver on the whole, that doesn't tell the story for my specific neighborhood necessarily. That doesn't tell the, the story for the neighborhood next to us. And that is where um, those real estate professionals are so, so valuable. Um, and, and yes, I think we will continue to be technology driven, um, but it, people are still at the center of the transaction. Yeah. It interesting to see what happened with uh with the the i buyer program now that now the uh, you know people buying homes and then selling them that's that's not new this this concept of zillow buying it directly is not new where they where they apparently made a big mistake is investors understand one thing is that you make your money when you go in as to where you're buying it you need to yeah. buy it at a good deal as an investment property where Zillow got greedy or, or just maybe lazy in this is saying, hey, well, we're going to bank on the market continuing to appreciate. So even though we're going to overpay for this house, um, you know, the, the market should save us. And it, and it did in some circumstances, um, but it's a very dangerous game when we get into that. And we see a lot of investors, uh, heard a lot of stories from investors that got into the speculation and believing, hey, I'm going to buy it here, but I just know in my head it's going to be worth more because of this factor if it comes true and, and maybe things pan out that way. Sometimes a good market can cover up a, a bad investment um, as the market shifts and you're doing it on that scale. Um, clearly didn't. The the part that, that frustrates me um, for some of our buyers is, unfortunately, they were sitting on dozens and dozens of homes. Um, I think the last time I looked, they were sitting on over a hundred homes that are sellable for potential buyers in this market, but they were just overpriced and, and somebody has got to worry about getting approved for it. Um, sometimes Zillow negotiated down. Sometimes they didn't, but yeah. you have people that are in this market ready to buy a home and they can't because a, a company's overshooting, trying to do it. So um, interesting news that, that came out of our industry uh here this this week i think it was this week last week yeah last week well and there are other companies like the i even the i buyer program is not new um but most of the time what would happen is if you are choosing the convenience of not putting your home on the market not um taking the time to do um any of the updates or anything like that then you would sell it for a lesser cost, you would sell it for a, a lesser amount. Um, but that convenience was worth it. Um, and, you know, depending on your situation, that still may be the best option for you. Um, but in this scenario, they were getting top way over dollar. Um, and they and the convenience and it's like, you can't always have your cake and, and eat it too that way. Um, so there are platforms that work in, in for the right circumstances, but the way that um, Zillow was, was formatted was just not sustainable and uh, not good for the bottom line. Yeah, and, and ultimately I think it's impacted negatively some consumers, obviously some homeowners that cashed out on it, they're super happy um, and Capitalism's real. I'm not going to fault anybody for taking more money, um, you know, but but definitely feeling for uh, for buyers and the homeowners in the community. Right. If you've got a house that's in your neighborhood, that's sitting, not selling. Right. You don't have somebody that's living in that house and taking care of it. You know, that, that, that's unfortunate. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how things play out um, over the next several months and maybe even a year. Um, and, and where we land with all of this. Yeah. yeah. So um, fantastic. As, as we wrap up, Brenna, now we are, are through Halloween, which we talked about one of your favorite holidays. We're coming up to probably my favorite holiday, which is Thanksgiving. Yep. Um, so tell me something specific that you look forward to as it comes to Thanksgiving. You know, I like, uh, 
football, family, and food. So um, just being together, uh, not a lot of pomp, of pomp and circumstance, just, you know, uh, getting that time to be together, have a great meal, uh, watching football, playing football, just something that is uh, fun and lighthearted and some good quality time. Um, you know, I think a lot of people's Thanksgivings looked really different last year. Um, and so I'm just looking forward to uh, being close to family. Yeah, a absolutely. You took mine. I, I said it's three of my favorite Fs. It's food, family, and football. Um, but mm -hmm. I absolutely love this time of year, just the gratitude for and appreciation for, um, you know, any gifts that, that, we've, that we have in this world. So. All right. Well, that's it for, for today, right? As we wrap up, um, if you like what you hear, make sure you're checking out the other episodes that, that we do. If you've got specific questions um, or there's somebody you think that we need to talk to an interview uh, that's connected into real estate, uh, shoot me a private message. Let me know and we'll make sure we, we get connected with them. So uh, Brenna, again, th thank you so much. Thank you for having me. We'll see you next month. All right. Take care.